In this lecture, we're going to begin with an exploration of all of the elements to crime. All criminal laws need the same basic foundations, and we're going to explore them first in a more general way. Later, when we begin examining specific crimes like homicide, we're going to take all of these general generalities and we're going to apply them to the specifics of the crimes that we study. So let's get started. The first thing that all crimes need is the act. Without the act, we don't have a crime. So here is our friend, Actus Reis, who we met in chapter one. Remember, the Actus Reis simply means the criminal act. So we have to do something and we have to have intended to do it. That's our mens rea, or our intent. Finally, we have to make sure that those two coexist, and they coexist at the exact same time. So when I committed the action, the, act, the intent has to be there at the time of that action. For example, if I break into a building, my act, in order to steal the electronics found there, my intent, then I have concurrence. If I break into that same building, steal my act, in order to seek relief from the outside elements, like the snow, then that's, and that's my intent, then there is no intent, there's no concurrence to prove me guilty of burglary. But sometimes intent doesn't even matter. If it was an accident, but something significant happened, I still might be guilty due to strict liability. For example, if a pedestrian runs across a crosswalk while you're driving through a yellow, right, yellow light, then you could potentially be guilty of involuntary or negligent manslaughter. Even though the intent wasn't there to kill that person, you still ran a yellow light and you still ended up hitting a pedestrian with your car. Strict liability allows for prosecutors to, to find individuals guilty for lower level crimes, even though the mens rea is absent. Most criminal activity is voluntary in nature. This means that we have made a conscious decision to engage in a criminal action. We engage in dozens of voluntary acts a day. Take a second and think about some voluntary acts that you engaged in today alone. I personally voluntarily sought out the coffee pot the moment I woke up and the moment that I got to work this morning. I voluntarily ate breakfast and did a number of other things throughout my day. But what about some involuntary ones? We also do many involuntary things without ever intending to do so or thinking about it. We breathe, we sneeze, and some of us snore when we sleep. So it makes sense that just like voluntary crime, we can also commit involuntary ty types of crimes as well. Typically, involuntary crimes extend to vehicular crimes such as involuntary manslaughter. What happens if I took too much cough medicine and then I drove? Or what happens if I got drunk and drove my car and killed someone? The voluntary aspects extend to the drinking, for instance, but legally, once you're intoxicated, you can't form intent. However, you are still responsible for all involuntary actions that occur as a result of your voluntary intoxication. Even though we can still be held liable for involuntary actions, we cannot be held liable for status crimes. Status is typically thought of in terms of labels. Drug addict, alcoholic, AIDS patient. So we cannot be held liable simply for having some sort of label or status. But whenever we intentionally use that status to commit crime, well then that's a different story. For example, as of 2010, 32 states have laws on the books that prosecute criminal transmission of HIV AIDS. This means that those infected would have sex with a partner knowing that they have HIV AIDS and they fail to inform the partner of their status. Furthermore, they may even fail to disclose the status in addition to foregoing some sort of prophylactic. The law also extends to sperm donations and organ donations as well. But there are also other cases in which legal precedent has gone in different directions. In the two court cases on your screen, Robinson v. California and Powell v. Texas, we see that one speaks to status and the other speaks to criminal activity. In Robinson v. California, Mr. Robinson was prosecuted for being addicted to narcotics. He was not caught committing any other crime other than being high at the time of his arrest. He wasn't even in possession of the drugs that he had used other than what was in his system. So this case didn't speak to possession laws or anything like that, simply just the behavior of being high and subsequently addicted to a, to a narcotic. The SCOTUS ruled that it is illegal to prosecute someone based on their status as an addict. 
In the second case, however, Powell v. Texas, Mr. Powell was a self-described alcoholic who kept, who kept getting arrested for public intoxication. He argued that because he was an alcoholic, he should not be found liable for being drunk in public. His arguments were based on the Robinson case that was tried six years earlier. The SCOTUS disagreed with Mr. Powell and stated that he was not being prosecuted for being an alcoholic, but rather he was prosecuted based on a public safety issue because he was drunk in public and he was causing a commotion. If he was simply drunk and he wasn't dis disturbing other people in public, then he would not have been arrested. These are two very similar cases, but the arguments are very nuanced in that they straddle the line between status and non-status type crimes. So far, we have discussed crime as an action, but what happens when I don't actually do anything? In some instances, it is criminal if I don't take action. In a 1907 case, People v. Beardsley, the SCOTUS ruled that even if we have a moral obligation to help others, we might not actually have a legal obligation to help. There is a big difference between the two. Instead, what we have are Good Samaritan laws that were put in place to protect those who try to intervene to help others. This means that you cannot be held criminally, criminally liable if you do something wrong when you're trying to help, but you can still be held civilly liable for your interventionary role. For example, if you intervene and make the situation worse, then you're liable for your role. If someone is drowning and you try to save them, but you yourself aren't a very good swimmer and you actually help them drown faster, then their death is your fault, but only civilly. The only exception to the Good Samaritan rule is when you have a duty to assist or to intervene. If it is your child or your spouse or your employee, then you are responsible for their care. For example, if your wife was in labor, then it's your, really your duty to help get her to the hospital and help get her help. If you don't help her, or if the child dies or your wife die, dies because of your inaction, then you can be prosecuted for that inaction. Some people have a strong duty to intervene. For example, a doctor who suspects that a child is being abused has to report it. Or if a rape victim comes to the ER and the rape kit is conducted, then the ER staff has to report that to the police. Or if a teacher or administrator suspects that a sexual assault has happened on campus, then they have to report that too. That was one of the issues that actually occurred on the Penn State campus when, when very limited reporting occurred during the years that Jerry Sandusky was molesting young children on campus grounds. Individuals also have a duty to care when a contract is in place. If I pay, if, if I pay you for your child care services, then you are responsible for the welfare of my child while she is in your care at the daycare. Finally, if you, if you have assumed care of an individual, then you are responsible for their welfare. This means that, for example, if I'm the designated driver and I volunteer to take all of my intoxicated friends home, then I have assumed care of them. If one of my friends dies of alcohol poisoning while he's at my house, and I was the one who took him there, then I am liable for his death because I did not intervene to help. All of those duties to intervene and assist are not structured in the fundamentals of other criminal laws that we have. So we have to figure out how those are treated in comparison to voluntary crimes. It comes down to intent, really. We started off saying that I can commit the same act, but the intent could be totally different. It is important to not confuse intent with motive. Motive, on the other hand, is the underlying reason for why you engage in a crime. I drive 100 miles per hour because I want to beat my friends in the race we're having. I steal someone's laptop because I want to pawn it for some extra money. I break into someone's house because I want their flat screen TV and I can't afford one on my own. Motive can sometimes overtake everything if that individual is determined to commit a crime. But it is still not the same as intent. Intent can be further broken down into different categories. We start with general intent. The words willfully or intentionally are often written within laws that speak to general intent. The prosecutor must establish only that the accused intended to commit an act that would cause harm to another. Think of it this way. You decide to hold up an all-night diner and steal the money that is being kept in the back, back room safe. 
This would cause financial harm to the owner, and you know that. But, the but any diner really is good enough. It could be the first diner you see. It could be the last diner you see. It doesn't matter as long as it is a diner that has money. Specific intent is a little bit different. Here the prosecutor must demonstrate that the offender possessed the intent to commit the crime and that there was specific intent for a particular desired result. In this example, you might have a very specific diner in mind that you want to rob because they always have a lot of business or you know that they just received payroll from the ranks truck. There is something about that one individual diner that causes you to choose it. There are these are typically known as crimes of cause and result. With constructive intent, we normally apply this to cases of gross negligence or recklessness that lead to a charge of manslaughter, for example. The intent to commit the reckless act is the mens rea in this, in, in this instance. So, if you get drunk and you get in a car and you drive, you are committing a reckless act. If you then kill someone, you can be charged with manslaughter. The constructive intent is the intent to drink and drive, regardless of the consequences, even though you did not intend to kill someone. Finally, with transferred intent, we see that sometimes an outcome occurs other than the one I originally wanted to happen. For example, let's say I try and shoot you, but I miss, and the bullet ricochets and it actually kills someone else. This is still a murder, so I'm still prosecuted the same way. The defendant's intent follows the bullet. Transferred intent does not apply to attempts. It has to be a completed homicide and also completed batteries. Of course, if there's no intent but an act still occurs, we have strict liability laws that, fall, that we can fall back on. Strict liability laws are absent of the words knowingly or purposely. The concept was first developed during the Industrial Revolution to safeguard against companies that would produce impure food, defective drugs, pollution, unsafe working conditions for their employees, these types of things. These companies might not have actually wanted you to die, and they didn't purposely set out to kill you, but it was cheaper to have unsafe working conditions than it was to actually do things according to code for the time. The same thing happens with drugs. We don't want to kill you, but putting cocaine in our cough syrup was thought to be appropriate for the time period. Now we have different levels of medical knowledge, and that's not appropriate anymore for us to have cocaine in our cough medicine. Finally, to end the lecture today, we need to discuss causality. Thinking back to chapter one, when we discussed the idea that my actions need to result in some sort of social harm. So, in order to hold me responsible, you have to show that I was directly responsible for the crime. This is a 1 plus 1 equals 2 equation that has to happen here. There are two types of cause that we use. The first is the cause and fact. This means that I am the direct factor that caused you to die. There is no other influential factor that would, would cause you to die. It's all my fault, really. I pulled the trigger. I shot you and you died as a result. Always look for the words but for here. But for my actions, would you have died? Secondly, we examine if there were any proximate causes present. Yes, I'm somewhat responsible because I set off the chain of events that ended in your death. If I hadn't shot you, then the ambulance would not have come out to help you. If the ambulance wasn't called, then it would never have run you over causing your death. So who's to blame here? Is it the ambulance fault or is it my fault? Proximate causes are further defined into two different categories. First, when there is a coincidental intervener, in, intervening act, then the defendant is not legally responsible for the victim's injury or the death if that injury or death results from the coincidental intervening act that was unforeseeable. For example, your book explains the case of a man who was recklessly driving and he wrecks his car. The driver decides that he's going to go walk for help and he leaves an injured passenger behind in the car. When, when he returns to the car, he learns that the passenger had just been mauled and eaten by a bear. The court ruled that the driver could not have anticipated that when he went to go get help after the accident took place that the injured passenger would have been eaten by this bear. It was unforeseeable and he is not responsible for the death. 
On the other hand, responsive intervening acts are those that are foreseeable. For example, if I crash my boat and it starts to sink, then it would be reasonable that you would try and swim to shore to save yourself. But what happens if you aren't really a good swimmer and the current's very strong and you end up drowning as a result? In this instance, I would be responsible for your death. With responsive intervening acts, the defendant is legally responsible because his or her action caused the victim to respond accordingly. These fundamentals are very important to digest and understand. They will be applied to all of the specific crimes that we study in the remainder of the semester. If you do not understand concepts like actus reus and mens rea now, you're going to have trouble applying them later on when we start to dissect crimes like homicide, assault, battery, and even robbery. The true elements of crime are universal and they really transcend the different categories of criminal behavior that we're going to examine. You will see these all again when we resume in the very next lecture. Thank you all for joining me today.